Welcome, everyone. It's indeed wonderful to have you join us in this conversation on International Women's Day. It's a conversation I've really been looking forward to having with these two remarkable women who I value both as dear colleagues and friends, Dr. Nancy O'Kale and Sarah Hagdusti. Now, before we begin, uh, let me just quickly orient you to how today's meeting will go. We've set aside about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, um, but if at any time you'd like to submit a question for the panel or for me, please do so in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the chat feature from any time now to say hello, let us know who you are and where you're calling in from. And throughout the conversation, please share any comments, insights uh, you might have in the chat as well. We'd certainly love to hear from you. So this International Women's Day, Plowshares Fund Equity Rises, again turns our full attention toward women who are challenging the notion that conflicts are the most effectively resolved through militarized responses. Our guests today are two of those women, and it's an honor to introduce them to the two of you. Nancy O'Hale is president and CEO of the Center for International Policy. She has more than 20 years of experience working on issues of human rights, democracy, and security in the Middle East and North Africa region. She brings to this conversation her scholarship, policy analysis, and advocacy for peace and gender equality. And Sarah Hagdusti is the executive director of Win Without War and Win Without War Education Fund. She brings a unique voice to foreign policy discourse as a Muslim woman with more than a decade of experience advocating for diplomatic solutions to crises involving nuclear non-proliferation, climate change, women's rights, and democracy. So welcome, Nancy and Sarah. Wonderful to have you here with us on this International Women's Day. Uh, let's dive right in. Um, I'm going to frame the conversation first and provide some context, and then we'll get going with Q&A. So really today, it's undeniable that many leaders consistently fail to provide genuine security or productive diplomacy. Many leaders equate safety and security with military might. In the current geopolitical context and the growing number of nuclear-related and nuclear-adjacent conflict feels both unprecedented and yet all too familiar. And in particular right now, we are all feeling the effects of the calamitous situation in the Gaza Strip, the risk of a wider war in the Middle East, the threat of a nuclearized Iran, and the global rise of authoritarianism. It's clear that we need a widespread reckoning and reorientation of domestic and foreign policies. And we know that women often lead the charge suggesting alternative diplomatic strategies and advocating for non-militarized resolutions to the world's problems. So with all of this in mind, let's jump into our discussion. So Sara, to you first, tell the audience what you do at Win Without War and what do you think is the most critical thing you're focused on right now and why? First of all, thank you so much for hosting this discussion and having me on, and it is such a privilege to be on with two such incredible women. I also, before I answer this question, I just want to say with this is a conversation with three executive directors who run national security organizations. I know that that has not always been possible, and International Women's Day is a day that was born out of women fighting for their rights. And I am so grateful to be able to do this work because of the struggle of so many who came before us. And I really want to start out by acknowledging them as well. Um, in terms of what Win Without War does and what we're doing, we are a grassroots organization with hundreds of thousands of activists across this country who come together to shift our government's focus and policies from using violence first approaches that often make everyone less safe to focusing on diplomacy and other solutions that can actually solve problems. Right now, we are really focused in on how we can get a ceasefire in Gaza. And also, I think one of the most important things we do across any of the issues we work on is really push back on this notion that everyday people don't care 
or do not have the expertise to be involved in decisions that involve war, peace, or how we orientate towards other countries. And in terms of the, again, it has been establishment, like thinking for so long that people don't care. And over the last few months, we have seen the level and depth of concern around what is happening in Gaza in this country and around the world. And it is reminiscent of, again, some of the biggest protests we saw globally around the Iraq war. People have always cared about these issues, but have also been systematically excluded from being at the tables where those decisions are made. And the other thing we do is this notion that only certain people have the expertise to be involved in this discussion is one we fundamentally reject. We believe that a lot of people have lived experience that is crucial in these debates, but also when you look at teachers, they often know how a conflict is going to impact their communities because they can see it playing out in classrooms. And that transformation, I think, is one of the most important things we help do across any issue we work on. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, very well put. Um, Nancy, turning to you, um, you were once tried and sentenced to prison in Egypt. Um, would you mind sharing your story with us? How has this experience shaped the work that you're doing now? Sure. And but first of all, I'm really grateful to be sharing this panel with you and Sarah. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, I mean, working in this field as much as it's difficult and depressing in so many ways this is the inspiration i get when i work with such brilliant and brave women and it means a lot to me um also before i start talking about my own experience uh i mean happy international women's day but also we need to recognize that as we speak 9,000 women have been killed in gaza and at a rate of 63 women per day, uh, which underscores how crucial the work that we were doing and what Sarah was talking about right now uh, is for lives. And we have to work hard and fast because every minute means a, a life lost. And because of that, it also makes it hard like when I talk about my own ordeal because it pales next to all those atrocities and, and losses. But it also is a representation of what's wrong with the system of security assistance and military aid. It's actually exactly on this day when I was tried in Egypt because of my work on uh, democracy and human rights that I was standing on Women's International Day in a cage in a, in a courtroom. Uh, and the reason why I was there, which is like a fabricated, uh, trumped up charges. Uh, and that was basically, I mean, started because after the revolution, the Supreme Council of Armed um, Forces in Egypt were uh, in charge of the transition. Uh, of course, not in good hands, knowing what militaries do when uh, they take charge, particularly after revolutions. And at that time, the United States had uh, announced that they will be giving um, around $65 million directly to civil society. That was the alarming part because it's not going to go through the pockets of the kleptocracy and the, the governments and the military. Because in Egypt, I, mean, I used to work at um, evaluation of foreign aid. Uh, and its impact in Egypt. In, and in Egypt, the, the foreign aid projects were sort of the uh, retirement package for military men when they get out. And because, I mean, it's just like, it's a, it's a source of money that is not really um, controlled or they're not held accountable for it because, I mean, like, they are the military. Uh, so um, I was the director of Freedom House at that time. We were working on several issues related to freedom and democracy, and also I mean, pointing out the atrocities of the military and the torture cases that they were having. Uh, and that did not really sit well with them. And of course, the trumped up charges relating to operating offices without a license. It was myself and 42 other NGO workers who are working with foreign organizations. But this was like the what was on the book. But the rhetoric overall that we are 
uh, spies and working for foreign, you know, the, the playbook of any authoritarian regimes. And we were standing in the cage and people were chanting for our execution. Now, because there were Americans involved in the case, they weren't in the cage, the US was trying to actually use its allegedly leverage uh, to resolve the case. And this is like very representative of what we're seeing today. The focus on transactional relationship rather than strategic relationship. The assumption that you could work with militaries that are authoritarian and corrupt and expect that they will be uh, collaborative with you and you can actually use the security assistance that you give as a leverage to change the director the direction even when you have americans on trial in egypt while you give 1.3 billion dollars of security assistance to egypt each year and you could not lift a finger and this is I mean, we can like continue this conversation uh, during the discussion, but it just like gives you like a snapshot of the problem that you could actually maneuver your way around just resolving this moment and think it's not going to have consequences, not just on the people of the country that you are giving like this aid to its military, but on your own citizens and you cannot do anything about it. And when you come to try to have a solution, your solution is also problematic because the solution was actually cutting a deal with the Egyptians in order to get the Americans out of the case. There are so many details, I don't want to say anything simplistic, but rather than trying to look at the bigger issue, the roots of the problem, why did we reach a point that the military is able to put 43 people on trial without any evidence and without any crime that they have actually committed because of the power and the involvement they are given by security assistance and military aid. Nancy, thanks for sharing that experience. Um, I know it's probably not always easy to talk about again and again, um, but thanks also for relating it to today and the problem with that transactional kind of approach rather than that bigger picture strategic root causes um, problem. So, so I'd like to turn to Sarah now um, to talk about the conflict in the Middle East, starting with the war in Gaza. Um, break down the conflict for us and what else is developing in the region as a result of this um, uh, war in Gaza right now. So I will just say, to break down this conflict over the course of anthologies and haven't been able to capture the entire nuance, but I will pull out three learnings around this conflict that I think you can see happening across many different places, but especially here. And what I'm seeing really clearly happening again between the conflict in Israel with Gaza right now is firstly, there is no military solution to countering extremism. Secondly, diplomacy works. And third, human rights need to be at the center of decision making if we want to achieve long lasting peace. Now, to pull that out a bit more, since the horrific events of October 7th, the Israeli government has been really clear that their goal for the war is to eradicate Hamas. Now, the challenge with that is that it's simply not possible. And we've seen that over and over again. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan not only didn't eradicate the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, they in fact helped spurn the start of ISIS, which created a whole other level of violence that then had to be dealt with. And we're seeing this happen again. After the level of horrific violence we've seen, we are no closer to eradicating Hamas than we were at the start of this. And it's simply because there is no military strategy that can achieve that goal. Now, the second point here is diplomacy works. We did have a brief ceasefire. It worked. Hundreds of hostages were released. People in Gaza got a brief and desperately needed reprieve from the violence. And I think what often a lot of people missed about that was regional escalation also halted. Like you saw things with the Houthis and 
throughout the region also halt during that ceasefire. It was one of the clearest examples of diplomacy working. And lastly, we genuinely need human rights to be at the center of decisions if we are going to create long lasting solutions. Now, successive US administrations have consistently sidelined Palestinian rights. And aside from that, a strategy we've seen in the Middle East over and over again that has failed is to bet on authoritarian governments in the name of stability. Now, I want to be really clear. This conflict is not going to be solved by the U.S. government trying to broker a new arms deal with Saudi Arabia. It is going to be solved by really listening to people in the region and making sure that everyone has access to self-determination, that no one is being evicted from their homes because of illegal settlements, and most of all, that everyone is able to live and thrive in real peace which means being able to live and thrive without the fear of violence. And that is the only way we're going to get a sustainable solution to this conflict. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I, I'd like to ask Nancy, how do, we, how do we get there? How do we more effectively address the root causes of war? And what are the conditions that are essential for diplomacy to succeed? Um, in the Middle East, but also to establish that foundation for durable peace. Thank you. Uh, well, as Sarah put it eloquently and like really succinctly of how the, how this uh, crisis came about, it's actually, I mean, just to follow on with what Sarah said, even if we get a ceasefire, uh, even if we get a lasting ceasefire, there is no indication that this would not be repeated again and again. And each time at a bigger scale and each time with bigger losses. Because the reason why the foundation upon which we, the, the foreign policy towards the Middle East and foreign policy in general, as we are seeing that is hyper-militarized, that is based on the conceptualization of arms for peace, that is based on an understanding of security in a very narrow way, uh, again, surrounding arms, rather than looking at the root causes, rather than looking at why these conflicts have erupted in the first place. Now, the problem also is with the solutions themselves that we have, because when we think that in, as, as Sarah gave, for example, the example of the uh, assumption around the, the US uh, Saudi Arabia defense deal that is like sugar coated and called normalization with Israel. I mean, this is problematic in so many ways, I mean, let alone like during these kind of circumstances, it's not even imaginable. But the reason why it's based on an assumption that you can have deals with authoritarian leaders who are not answering to their people, who do not represent their people, and think that this would lead to a durable peace. And also, the assumption that you can have those deals and throw crumbs to the Palestinian and somehow wish that it's going to disappear, this issue is going to go away. It's also another problem with the issue. Now, I want to move to just like, what, what tools do we have? I mean, other than military, we have the law. This is what we, I mean, all try to use as uh, as the tool and the mechanism to replace, I mean, military solution with diplomatic solution. But there is a problem here, though, because when you're looking at the laws in a way that is abstract, in, in, in abstract outside of the power dynamics around it, it does not really become effective. Take, for example, I mean, the, uh, let's say, the Arms Control Act in Congress, that is, it is, it implies that any government to government sale that is above $50 million, that means that the, the Congress should be notified. Now, this is the rule. You can always get around that. But as we are seeing right now with the U.S. sales to Israel to circumvent the Congress and oversight, that you just go below that 
level and start I mean, like making those sales without the notification. So this is one problem. The other problem is that when we're looking at laws, for example, like the Leahy laws and, and other laws that also I mean, try to regulate the sales, uh, arms sales and security assistance, that really pours down to the notion of misuse of arms. This notion in itself is problematic because the corollary of it, that there is a good use of arms, and that is a legitimate way of arms in defense, and you can label it in so many ways. And the problem, yes, you do need arms for defense, but the problem also is like, who decides that who deserves to live and who deserves to die? Who is labeled as a terrorist? I mean, most authoritarian regimes in the region and beyond they label their opposition as terrorists or belonging to a terrorist organization. And by doing so, they're not breaking the law. They are committing like the, following the counterterrorism operation that is in agreement with the United States. So the problem is that not just that we are looking at military solution, but when we come to look at uh, other diplomatic solutions or use our accountability mechanism, we, we use them without looking at the power dynamics within which it is embedded. Uh, thanks so much, Nancy. Um, there's clearly that difference between what's on the books and then how it's being used or, or manipulated. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to shift um, a little now to Iran. Um, I mean, it's all very much related, obviously, um, but at Plowshares Fund, we are really focused on trying to find a diplomatic solution to um, the Iran nuclear program and make sure that Iran doesn't make that decision to acquire a nuclear weapon. Um, Sarah, you know, can you give us a bit of insight to the extent you can on what you think is driving Iranian politics and decision making right now? And what is some of those core issues that must be addressed before we can have resilient and effective resolutions? So I think that a lot of things drive Iranian policies and politics. And I think it's, again, here, really, really important that when we talk about Iran, we remember that diplomacy worked. The JCPOA, the Iran deal worked. It was not based on trust. It was based on objectively verifiable information. It increased inspections. It contained the program. It worked on every possible metric. So, and right now, what we're seeing is in a world where we don't have that and we have a regional war, we're not at risk at getting there. We are there. Since the situation in Gaza has deteriorated, we've seen spillover violence in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq. And these types of wars, these types of moments, always spur arm races and always spur more countries wanting to build up their military defenses, wanting to spend more money on weapons. And when you add in the layer of nuclear proliferation to that equation, it becomes very, very horrifying very, very quickly. So again, here, I think the one of the most important things we can do to create that space for getting back to diplomacy or getting back to something like a JCPOA with Iran is really focusing on how do we get a ceasefire in Gaza? We have to be able to contain the regional crisis that is happening. And in a way, to Nancy said, that is actually going to be sustainable. There, We need to really push for not the same type of politics over again, but a true a ceasefire, and then really focusing on how do you bring in what people want to create a durable peace so that we can start resolving other longstanding issues as well. And I also, like, if you all indulge me, there's something else I want to say about Iran on International Women's Day. And one is, for my entire adult life, I have identified as a feminist, and often people assume that I identify that way because of the brutally horrendous policies the Iranian government has towards women. And that wasn't the case for me. For me, I identified as a feminist because 
from a very young age, all around me, I saw women being unabashed in terms of pushing for their rights. I saw them going down the street and arguing with armed guards over what they wanted to do and not taking no for an answer. That kind of strength and resilience is something that I grew up with, learned from, and was where I was taught my feminism. And I was really grateful when the when the whole world got to see that during the Masa Amini protests and really seeing how fierce and committed women in Iran have been for longer than I've been breathing, frankly, to their rights and to that pursuit. And the thing I really want to say clearly here that women in Iran, in Syria, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, they don't need saving, they need seats at the table. And that is one of the most important things we need to remember as women outside of those places who want to be in allyship. Fantastic, Sarah. And um, thanks for not only sharing that experience of yours, which I think not a lot of people seem to get, but to to, to really push back against those stereotypes um, and to relate that to the bigger picture and what we need to be doing now, because we certainly do tend to talk and in the media about women as victims of conflict and not as agents of change. But what you're you're saying is that they are there and we need to be led by them. And and I, I'd like to now ask Nancy about this, how she feels right now in this particular situation. How does she women see women women being impacted by, responding to, and resisting state and civil violence in the Middle East? Uh, well, we're, we're, we're seeing it every day just by surviving. And, uh, and, and I know we watch the television and we see the struggle and everything, but it is actually pours down to the minute details. The messages I, I get from my friends in Gaza and talking about like really, I mean, intimate things about just like, how can you just like, shower in uh, and how can you not be able to have a relationship with your family anymore because everyone is cramped in one room it's just like the details of the everyday life and the ability to see those women still able not just to survive but even find humor and laugh about themselves it's just like they send me messages that are like actually makes me laugh and cry at the same time because they learn how to survive for a long time but that should not be the case they should not be just surviving they should not be just moving from one safe zone to the other in order to avoid whoever is making the decision which part of Gaza now that is going to be targeted I mean, this is normal like with not normal is not the right way I mean it's like it's conventional at times of war that people use all the creative mechanisms to self-organize, to find solidarity, to find ways to escape death. However, while you're doing that, even if those women survive and their children, whoever is left, that does not solve the problem and it doesn't stop there. Protracted conflict is a real thing. It never evaporates. And, and that's why any attempts for ceasefire or even a bigger like a larger broader peace that is not founded on the the principles of accountability and reparation for all what's happening for all sides for the families of the hostages on one side and also for the people who that it's not going to last and it's, it's unfair to even think of it, that it will last, that you now, okay, today we decided we are not gonna bomb you anymore. Now go and start your life again and uh, right to return and all those theoretical I mean, words that they keep repeating on just to give people some sedatives that things will go back into normal. Let's talk about the day after. You cannot talk about the day after when you know that today there is suffering and the suffering has to have a cost and someone has to pay this cost. And the cost should never be just with the two opposing parties who are engaged in that, but also those who are profiting from it has to pay a cost. 
the defense industry, as soon as it's always shielded from that, hiding behind governments, this will never stop. And you will see it in Gaza and more and everywhere around the world where, where there is no injustice and there is no accountability. Thanks so much, Nancy, for reminding us of that hidden factor that's not often discussed, which is who is um, benefiting um, from what's happening. And um, uh, such an important thing for us to all be looking at. Um, I'm going to, in a few minutes, in about seven minutes or so, throw to Q&A from the audience. But I want to I want to ask a question that's maybe a little bit different um, of both Sarah and Nancy. Um, you know, I think we are all women leading organisations that work on slightly different things, but we have shared goals and shared values. And, and at Plowshares right now, we're really focusing on trying to create those conditions for members of the field to do their best work together, which means collaborating and aligning rather than competing, which is often natural when there are limited resources. Um, and we try to create those conditions and take away some of those barriers. Um, and in talking about this with Sarah recently, she's shared a fascinating agreement that the two of you have between each other. And um, I'd love for you to share it with our audience because I was um, so kind of uh, delighted when I when I heard about it. So I'll throw it over to the two of you about um, how you do your work and conspire together. Um, I can start this off and Nancy, feel free to jump in. I. I remember when Nancy and I first met and there like we have such a deep value set and she is just such an inspiration and an extraordinary human. We also, I believe, both have had experiences of when there are, when you are a woman in leadership, especially as a woman of color, you can often be pitted against others. And there's often the sense that like, there's only room for one of you in those positions. And we, at that very first meeting said that we were not going to allow that to happen to us, that we were going to work together. And we kind of created a non-compete clause with each other where our, and like for us, it also, we share this value of, no one organization, no one human has the solution here. Our work is fundamentally better when we can collaborate together. My work would not do as well if it wasn't for Nancy's work. The amount of times Win Without War uses the policy expertise of CIP, it happens on a daily basis. So yes, I want CIP to have all of the resources because that makes my work easier. Nancy is one of the smartest people I know, and I want her to be in every room talking and giving her opinions because it will make the positions better. So we just very much created that explicit agreement. And I have to say, it's been like a year or so now, and it's we've been thriving as a result, and it brings me a lot of joy. I, I would say exactly the same about Sarah, and it's been really a pleasure uh, and inspiration to see the work that Sarah does. And, and also what Sarah has described is not just confined to just the two of us thinking, I mean, and agreeing. There is like a sort of a common denominator out there that you share the same values and you're aligned. Oh, and that is existing in most of the community we were like progressive organizations however there is a problem and this is a structural problem and, and problem and it relates to the different ways of funding and support that leads and, and i'm going to be brutally frank here that some donors create a situation where organizations that's supposed to collaborate with each other they end up competing with each other and, and actually this part of it is on the organization. Part of the work that CIP is doing is also founded on the idea that we need to build and strengthen the community. We will not do anything impactful if CIP, for example, on its own become the most successful organization in, in the US. It will not do anything. And also the realization as Sarah pointed that we play different roles. I mean, 
the what I can produce like the most uh, um, rigorous uh, quality research and knowledge out there if it's not taken by an organization like Win Without War and just use this for advocacy, for pushing the message, for reaching broader people, it will not mean anything. It will be nice fancy words on, on paper or on a, on a computer screen. That's why, I mean, it's not something that we're doing as a favor for each other. We really need to work together. And this is something that should be not just um, being done organically, like the, the pact that Sarah and I have, they were conspiring together, but also it should be something that is encouraged by the funders on understanding and really seeing what do we need to change with the structure? Because at the end of the day, sometimes the organization have to perform for the funders. I mean, they are pushed to do that. They need to survive. And it's a very difficult field to work with. And in order to do that, they have to show that they can do this and that and have the most, and I'm the most deserving, instead of actually creating a framework for change that is pushed and promoted by the organization and the funders that allows for this kind of collaboration to have a strong community rather than having like all the resources spread thin across organizations either doing the same things or competing with each other. I knew I was going to forget mute at some point in addition to the beginning. Um, what you're saying is really music to my ear and people might be surprised to hear that, right? I mean, I think you're pointing out the challenging role that some funders can sometimes play and the roadblocks we can unintentionally put in the place of progress. So, you know, we really over the last year and a half have been internally um, uh, looking at our practices and listening to people in the field about where are those pain points? Um, and trying to figure out how do we take away the structures that prevent collaboration? Because we know everybody wants to be able to say, look, I did this. I used my context to have this happen. And um, if we're looking at that as the sole kind of way of um, supporting the field, we're going to miss out on the important role that an ecosystem needs to play. We need many people with different kinds of capacities, with the analysis, the research, and then the grassroots and the um, campaign kind of work to all work together to further our goals. So thank you for raising it. It's something that we are working on actively. We've started our new field building department. Stay tuned for more, but um, we're really thrilled to have you as part of this community. Um, and I'm really excited, particularly after this discussion to see where we all go together next. So uh, let's move on to some questions from the audience. So I've got one here. Um, keep your um, questions coming. All right. So this is from an anonymous guest who said, both panelists mentioned that it's impossible to broker a deal with, author with authoritarian regimes that do not represent their people. How does this translate to brokering a nuclear deal with Iran, considering the vehement violations of human rights by the Iranian government especially in light of the 2020 crackdown on protesters and the horrendous policies of the government that restrict the rights and voices of women. Sarah, I'm going to throw this one over to you, um, given that you're one of the um, leading uh, uh, voices and groups um, working on uh, the Iran uh, portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the really important thing to pull out here is in the context of the Iran deal, what a lot of people can often forget about is there is still incredibly broad-based sanctions that are hurting people every single day in the country and have made medicine scarce, have made access to basic resources scarce. And when you're looking at that, that also impacts civil society groups. And there's been article after article, research after research, that shows that when you have those kinds of conditions, it doesn't make civil society stronger. It actually strengthens authoritarianism. So for me, one of the most important reasons around why you need to get to a nuclear deal is we need to stop collective punishment in Iran. That is what is happening right now. The fact that we have seen 
over and over and over again how far away the Iranian government is from representing its people. And yet our current policy tool is we should just keep punishing the people who are doing everything they can and risking their lives to create change is completely incoherent. Now, that is one of the reasons why I don't think there is a contradiction there between wanting to see that solved so that we can end collective punishment in Iran. Thanks very much, Sarah. Nancy, yeah, jump in. At, uh, and, and that speaks to one of your questions about like peace deals and like the diplomacy when it works. I mean, the example of the GCPOA is an example of a deal that worked and had an effect on a particular issue. When we are looking at that and when we're looking at broader like, deals, for example, I mean, the, the, the arms and security system that the United States gives to Egypt, the $1.3 billion a year, is part of the Camp David deal of like the accord between Israel and Egypt. That means that this should include in it oversight and accountability as a core issue. That means that this money is going for a particular use and is monitored and evaluated, not just given as like a, a package that of money and, and resources that they can use in whatever way. And also, I mean, they, they sh should be used as it's claimed to be as a leverage. And that leverage could be used when we see that it's being used in a way that is against human rights and against the values that we want to promote. So having a peace deal without a component of accountability is useless and not useless. It actually can be harmful in, in that sense. Thanks to you both for, for sort of drilling down a bit more deeply into the different situations here right and the, the different motivations and the different kind of contexts and um, we've got a question from kate um which is following up on sarah's point that women don't need saving they need a seat at the table and um, kate asks can you talk about the institutional and interpersonal barriers for women to be at the table despite us commitments to inclusion uh, she says and why are we seeing the administration meet abundantly with israeli women while palestinian women must disrupt in order to be heard but are not consulted as policy partners. I think this is an incredibly big challenge in terms of needing a seat at the table. Uh, one of the most important things I believe we can advocate for is when we're looking at post-conflict Gaza, civil society groups need to have a seat at the table. They can't just be all of the same politicians who have made all of the same mistakes over and over again. So there's structural things that we need to have early interventions on to help this from, to help make sure this happens. And we do just keep need to keep pushing for this over and over again. And it's not just about having a seat at the table. It's also about having the platforms, having the resources, having everything else that goes with it. And also the recognition of the very different experiences women have in those rooms and often the impacts when they are in those rooms and go back to their communities. So Nancy has made this point brilliantly in many other forums. We often look at these issues as individual challenges that individual women need to overcome, where we need to start looking at what are the systematic challenges we can start leveraging to really address the underlying sexism that over and over again is locking out women, but also locking out particular perspectives that counter militarism from these rooms and from these decision-making arenas. Thanks, Sarah. This, um, we've got a kind of related question from Catherine and maybe, maybe Nancy wants to take this, which is she hasn't heard mention of UN Resolution 1325 in discussions about either Ukraine or Gaza and Resolution 1325 affirms the appointment importance of the participation of women, the inclusion of gender perspectives in peace negotiations, humanitarian planning, peacekeeping operations, and post-conflict peace building and governance. So she's wondering, have people been trying to use this resolution to get more women involved? Have you come across that? 
yes, but also, I mean, we are talking about institutions that are part of the problem and uh, in the UN itself also, and who's got access. And, and, and that also relates to the, the previous uh, call. There is an assumption that once you bring women to the table or the marginalized people to the table, this will immediately be translated into inclusion. That is, that's tokenization. In order to have real inclusion, we need to look at the structural barriers for that. And even just like the comment about like having their inviting Israeli women and not uh, others, even if they, even the Israeli women, which, which Israeli women that are being invited and who did they represent? There are Israeli women who, who are for ceasefire. Uh, do they represent everyone? And when they sit at the table, are they representing themselves or are they representing their government? And that's why they have that seat at the table. So we need to unpack those labels and understanding that it is not just sitting at the table. Actually, that's why the problem of the program of the DEI is not really effective because it's mostly about tokenization. Because when you bring a woman or someone who is in a less powerful position in a structure that is like unequal in terms of power, those people would do their best to fit in, to make sure that we are like you. It's, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of like a space like that. This is for me, and I'm sure for, for both of you, very strange. I mean, like in a security discussion and it's all women, <laughs> always it's usually just the only woman in the room and probably the only brown woman in the room. And so it's, it takes more than just a resolution. Is it important? Yes, it is important, but it's a necessary and insufficient condition on understanding the issue of access and the power that comes with it. Fantastic. Um, Nancy, and I think that the, the, the more we can address those structural challenges and break through them, uh, the better. So a lot of attention um, we need to put, put on that. Um, so uh, I think we've got one time for one more question from the audience from Nina Warner. Um, what does durable peace mean or look like in Gaza in contrast to the military solutions that we're seeing now? Who wants to take that 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 easy? I can, take, I can take the first part of this and I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way in terms of things in Gaza are really heartbreaking right now. And I know that in moments like this, a lot of people are thinking about like, what, how do we even ever get to a place of change? And like, even just imagining a world where we do have durable peace feels very far away. And the thing that brings me hope is remembering that that work is already happening. We bought a peace delegation to DC a few weeks ago from a group called Combatants for Peace, which are phenomenal. And if you haven't heard of them, you should Google them immediately. Um, but essentially what that group does is they're a group with Israeli and Palestinian leadership who work with former combatants in the conflict who have now given up their arms and are working for nonviolent solutions. Every year they hold memorials for folks in the conflict who have died, which is incredible, and are doing that sustainable work of how do you bring these communities together? How do you create that connectivity? And that kind of peace entrepreneurship is happening. People are already making huge strides to this. Now, what we need to do is again, A, recognize them, this isn't something that isn't happening. It is. There are communities doing this. They're thriving. Now, all we need to do is get them more power and more resources so they're the types of people who are driving decisions and not the people who have made the same failed policy choices over and over again. Just one thing to add to that. I mean, I fully agree with Sarah, uh, but I think in order to really have durable peace and resolve this, we also have to recognize that this conflict is not just about what is happening on the regional level. The domestic politics and the politicization of the crisis is, has a huge 
impact of its continuation and escalation as well. It's no secret that the Netanyahu government has a vested interest to continue this war because it knows that Netanyahu himself knows is like what would happen when this war ends. The same thing for Hamas and the same thing for other, I mean, powers who are involved and they're worried about their own elections and the impact of that. So we have to be clear about like who are the parties involved and whose interest is being served when we are approaching this. Otherwise, we would be just like fooling ourselves. That I think was a terrific um, note and word of wisdom as we think about approaching this conflict and really peeling back where are the interests um, and who's benefiting from the status quo and who is resisting change. Um, I do want to leave on an optimistic note. Um, and so I wanna ask both of you, <laughs> what are you optimistic about? Nancy, let's start with you and close out with Sarah. It's a, a very, very difficult question at <laughs> this moment. Um, well, um, okay. it doesn't come from optimism. It comes from realism uh, that this is not sustainable, what's happening right now. And it cannot be, I mean, it cannot continue this way. Uh, for so many reasons, I mean, and, and it will get worse before it gets better. But I also think that as much as like we're seeing all those powers and like the, the atrocities that we are seeing in front of our eyes every day, we are also seeing an incredible level of solidarity that I haven't seen before for not just for the Palestinian cause, but generally, like even since the Iraq war. That means a lot. That means a lot that people are sustaining different ways of protesting and demanding change, both those who are working on the grassroots level, those who are working in protests, but also organizations like ours who are communicating and connecting, trying every day to find solutions and to try to bring people together. It has to have come to an end. It will be a disaster. And I'm not going to fool anyone to say that things will get better because it is disastrous as we speak. But also, I mean, a moment like this where people are sitting together and trying and, and hold their sense themselves responsible. Because I believe that we are all responsible and we're all implicated. And we all have to be serious and sort of hold ourselves accountable and uh, to, to higher standards, even because we are in a safer position than, uh, than others. Uh, but I think, I mean, it's just like there, we are not in, in uh, 20, 2003 at the time of the Iraq. It's a different age. The level of awareness, the level of connectivity, the level of understanding of issues is completely different. And this is what is just missed by actually the governments and the power that are involved. They really don't understand how much the, the entire environment, the world has changed so much than two decades ago. And this is my source of optimism. Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. All right. What's yours? For me, I remember after the big protests against the Iraq war, when then a little known candidate named Barack Obama started the race with an anti-war speech. And I think about the sheer volume of incredible grassroots organizing we've seen around the world and that how that is shaping an entirely new set of politics and a new generation of leadership. And I think we are going to see those leaders getting into positions of power within the next few years and having an entirely different approach, knowing that here good policy is good politics as well. And I think that is going to absolutely amplify and speed up the rate of change in some of these issues. And that is the thing I'm excited to meet the leaders who are going to emerge from this moment and the change they are going to create. Fantastic. Well, I'm optimistic um, about where we're going with the two of you in these wonderful positions you are in um, the collaboration and the clear-eyed analysis of what are the underlying 
root causes of conflict right now and the best approaches that aren't knee-jerk um, emotional ones but are ones that forefront the people who are suffering and the ones that are most likely to lead us to success. So I'm really optimistic about our future with the two of you and our partnership. I'm also uh, really inspired by the comments in the chat. Um, thanks to everyone for weighing in and sharing your thoughts. We're taking note um, and we'll be in touch uh, with all of you there. So Sarah, Nancy, thank you so much for spending International Women's Day with us, for sharing your time and for the work that you do. So now it's my opportunity to say thank you to our generous, engaged and committed donors who've made it possible for us to champion people like Sarah um, and Nancy, um, to champion the policies, experts, activists and scholars who are charting the way towards a world free of nuclear threats. We are really proud to bring you the best minds and analysis on the critical nuclear issues of the day, of the merry moment that we are living in right now. Plowshares is fueling the intellectual, political, and organizing resources we need to address the threats facing the peace and security field. And together with you, we hope to move the dial toward diplomacy and a safe and secure future for all. I'd also like to extend a warm invitation for you to join us on Monday, June 24th for our annual gala chain reaction. This year's gala will be held in person in San Francisco also with the option to watch via live stream. We hope to see you there. So keep an eye on our website and social media for more information as it becomes available. Nothing about this work is easy, um, but nothing about this work is impossible either. Uh, you are an integral part of creating a world safe from nuclear weapons. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for caring about these issues, our planet and fellow humans, and thank you for staying engaged. Have a lovely rest of your International Women's Day and hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.